On this edition of Independent Sources, the Hispanic mayor. Is there a viable candidate on the horizon to be the city's first Latino mayor? Let the Fury Have the Hour, a new film explores creative counterculture in the United States. And at World's End, a choreographer interprets Mayan myth through dance. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Piafier. And I'm Diana Ravinka. Political pundits have taken to calling Hispanics the minority majority, a term that's reflective of the group's growing numbers and political power. But there are those who question the validity of that power. They contend that despite the size of the population and the fact that a number of Hispanics hold positions in local government here in New York City, few of them hold state or federal offices. The debate's already gaining momentum in the run-up to next year's mayoral election. So far, only Adolfo Carion Jr. has made his intentions known, but he's already got his detractors. City Limits magazine recently published a five-part series taking a closer look at the history of Hispanic political power in the city and the possibility of the next mayor being Latino. Angelo Falcon of the National Institute for Latino Policy and City Limits Magazine contributor Ed Morales joined me in studio to talk about the issue and the series. Ed, um, I had a wonderful weekend reading five-part series that you wrote for City Limits. Tell us a little bit about the uh, genesis of the series. Okay. Well, uh, it came about as a result of a meeting I had with City Limits editor Jarrett Murphy and um, I guess the reason for it is is because uh, this is something that uh, in the Latino community we're, you know, we've, uh, at first it was something that came up every few years, every election cycle, and, um, you know, it's almost the, uh, the discussion of it has been muted of late, but uh, we decided that because of the importance of the Latino community, because of uh, the, the demographic figures, even though the voter participation rate is uh, <clears throat> somewhat low, um, and and the fact that it was it was rather shocking to feel that there was no really qualified candidate for uh, mayor who mm -hmm. was Latino in the next election cycle, and of course you know if you if you are a party uh, loyalist you know um, if uh, unless you are going to be against the the candidate uh, in the Democratic Party next time you're looking at really eight years from now to be the next time for a Latino to run if there's no qualified uh, candidate now because you're going to assume that um, well how do, how yeah. do you define qualified candidate I mean mm -hmm. uh, someone with a with a platform uh, constituency and visibility and uh, uh, charisma and ability to think on their feet you know and uh, and present uh, a proposal for for becoming mayor well Angelo how do we get a, a qualified candidate or do we have many to what do you think well you know I think first of all I want to commend the Ed uh, because I think this uh, series is very important and I think it kind of pulls together a lot of uh, important facts about Latino politics um, from uh, I think a very uh, well-informed uh, you know point of view and that's rare uh, you know I do a lot of research on Latino politics nationally in, in New York and this really isn't that much written that's worth much uh, to useful so I, w I wanted to just kind of said, say that publicly. Um, no, I, th I think um, in terms of qualified, qualified is an interesting thing. It's not an individual characteristic only. You know, uh, it's not simply is it a person smart, uh, but it also has to do with the kind of networks that they belong to uh, and the kind of resources they bring to bear. And one of the things that um, is one factor that I think that's very important uh, has been um, the fact that the Latino community has been one of the most important, uh, most loyal uh, constituents of the Democratic Party and the party has over the years just basically taken the, the community and its uh, political leadership for granted in many ways so I think um, uh, the idea that the political Democratic Party could be nurturing could be de developing those networks could be putting resources into uh, developing Latino leadership at the citywide statewide level uh, the fact that that's not occurring the fact that there are no Latinos for example in any major leadership positions within the Democratic Party itself 
is I think is is uh, was an important factor. Ed, you mentioned uh, Adolfo Carrion. What about him? I mean, does he have the network? Does it have the the clout to really make a strong push for mayor? Well, I think he was in a really good position. He was at the now the classic launching point for a Latino candidate for mayor. He was a uh, Bronx Borough president, and uh, he was well regarded uh, to to an extent, although. There were some disagreements from uh, activists in the Bronx about the way he handled the Yankee Stadium deal, felt they s he sold out too much of the community. Of course, that doesn't translate that much in, in negatively in, into his possible campaign run. But the major problem with him is his taking the job at HUD and basically disappearing from the consciousness of uh, New Yorkers for a while. And that's something that can be really deadly for a candidate. Now his reemergence, uh, you could say it's a, maybe a logical thing for him to do to try to use the venue of the Republican Party because particularly after the last election, the Republican Party uh, is recognizing the mistake it made about the way it handles Latinos. You're talking about the national election. Yes. Okay. But, um, you know, I think that that can translate, you know, even into a local race where, you know, here and there, especially in a high-profile race like New York City mayor, that uh, certain Republican operatives or people who funnel uh, campaign contributions might want to get behind someone like Adolfo Carrion as a newer kind of uh, a Republican candidate, a Latino, to move the, the party away from, you know, the terrible reputation that it's built up uh, because of its uh, an, uh, strong anti-immigration stances or really anti-human. At anti times we've stances. seen uh, in the city Dominicans against Dominicans supporting a, a non-Dominican uh, candidate. Uh, when we talk about Latino, well, as you know better than I do, it's a broad term. It's not homogeneous. Can the Latino community coalesce first within themselves and then be able to reach out and build coalition to elect a Latino mayor? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, you know, there are different, you know, within the, New York's probably one of the most diverse Latino cities in the, in, in the, in the, in the world, possibly. And, uh, but one of the things that's been interesting is, in fact, when there is a Latino candidate, there is this kind of coalescing in terms of voting. Fernando Ferrer, when he ran, uh, you know, had a lot of detractors. For example, there were many detractors in Washington Heights in the Dominican community who said, we don't want this Puerto Rican guy to win because then those guys in the Bronx, what we call the Bronx boys, are going to control the politics, are going to have to go to them, so we're going to support the, the other guy. But that didn't translate in terms of the community itself. Those were political kind of elites talking among each other. But when it comes down to uh, seeing a credible Latino candidate, um, I think you wind up getting uh, tremendous support uh, from the Latino community if you have someone with a lot of visibility. And, and you know, you take someone like uh, Fernando Ferreira, I think he was a very lackluster candidate, and still he got a very high, high percentage of the Latino vote, not just in Puerto Rican areas, but in Dominican areas and not in Queens as well. So, yeah, I think it's there. It's just uh, sometimes you have to be careful when you talk about the Latino community, you're talking about these kind of this political class uh, versus the community itself and the, the different dynamics, I think, and, and at these different levels. Ed, speaking of Fernando Ferrer, former Bronx uh, borough president who ran for mayor in 2000, uh, Angela said he was a lackluster uh, candidate. And then you had Herman Badillo, uh, who preceded him. He was a congressman. How far has the Latino politics come since those days? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would say that, uh, you know, those two candidates, as I explain in my article, they're two different examples of, uh, of, of the possibility of ethnic succession uh, as, uh, you know, a normative uh, experience for, uh, for, uh, for a group like, uh, like Latinos to ascend to the, the mayoralty of New York. Um, many of the people I interviewed felt that Herman Badillo um, failed to acknowledge the growing nationalist movements um, and identification of Puerto Ricans and other Latinos as people of color in his uh, quest to gain the mayoralty. Uh, Fred, uh, Freddy all had similar problems, although overtly um, he tried to play sort of both roles. That's the thing about Latinos. The way that we fit into the racial binary makes it problematic as far as um, our electability and many other facets of life. Um, Freddy Ferrer, there were times that he tried to project himself as uh, Catholic to appeal to ethnic European voters, mm -hmm. and uh, but his ability to appeal to uh, Puerto Ricans who identified as people of color um, was limited, um, especially uh, talking to a lot of people that uh, I, I did. 
but his Two Cities campaign actually addressed that better than almost any other mayoral candidate has up to this point. That um, was his yeah. poverty, uh, yes. the inequality mm -hmm. of New York City. Right. You know, Angela, um, let's look at the candidates. Uh, again, going back to carry on, is there anybody else that you know we should be looking at that maybe it's not on the radar a screen of the mainstream or general media, but in Latinos community, they are really strongly supportive of this person? Well, right now, the only person that was uh, kind of uh, beginning to peek up at the possibility was uh, the Bronx Borough President. Uh, and, uh, That's uh, Diaz, Ruben Jr. Diaz Jr. Uh -huh. um, and he's decided uh, not to go for the uh, mayoralty, but to run for uh, controller. As, I, as, far as, I, as far as I understand, there are other people that are coming up. I think uh, Peralta, Jose Peralta, da in Queens, who's thinking of running for uh, the borough president of Queens. Um, there are people like that that are beginning to emerge. Gustavo Rivera is kind of like a new face up in the Bronx. He's the guy who unseated Pedro Espada, the notorious Pedro <laughs> Espada. <laughs> So there, there are some faces. Uh, it's going to take some, uh, some time, and it's going to be the person's going to have to be very creative. Because uh, you know, as Ed said, when you're running for mayor, you can't just run as a Latino. You can't run as a Puerto Rican. You have to appeal to different people. And, and also, when you talk, you evaluate these guys, uh, these candidates, you have to also put it in some historical context. There was a time in Badillo's time when Puerto Ricans made it into the political system when there were fights among political elites. And uh, Wagner uh, uh, and all these guys had a fight, and then that created a space. By the time Freddie comes in, there's already, as uh, you know, you mentioned in one of the articles, already a base in the Bronx. That is, Latinos, Puerto Ricans have taken over the Bronx machinery, the democratic machinery, and that created a base. That created a, a place, uh, a springboard. Uh, that's kind of dissolved now. It's been, been you know, it's all well, over Well, it's changed somewhat. You know, you have Dominican in the mix right now. But one last question, Ed. Uh, there's a point that you made in your article that I love, and I'd like you to talk about it. There's only one point that you made? <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, Jeez. since we don't have an hour or two hours to discuss this. But uh, the point you made about Obama's election didn't really change African-American lives, but it was more about the pride. Uh, and, and you said the same thing about the Hispanic. How much would it mean for... Uh, New Yorkers to have a Latino uh, mayor. Yes, um, there, there's a lot of cultural capital to be gained from the presence of uh, a leading political figure. The way that uh, Obama, you know, has given uh, African Americans and other people of color, um, you know, it's not just limited to sure. African Americans. Um, and uh, sure, uh, a Latino mayor would, um, you know, ha have so many uh, subtle effects just in terms of even in the educational system, uh, young people feeling that, uh, you know, they might have a chance at a leadership position and uh, that uh, people uh, at least would feel that, you know, their needs may be spoken to at some point even though it's not happening all at once. Okay. So uh, I, I do feel that uh, also in terms of uh, galvanizing more Latino voter participation, I think um, a, a Latino uh, mayor would make a great deal of difference. Well, thank you very much, Ed Morales, Angela Falcon. Thanks for a great discussion. Okay, thanks. Still up on independent sources, talking counterculture in the United States. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Vianor. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic and community media. From El Diario La Prensa, concerned parents and activists are pushing for PS 132, Juan Pablo Duarte, in Washington Heights, to remain open. The elementary school, which serves the largest population of recently arrived immigrant children, is facing closure due to a poor grade from the Department of Education. Public schools that receive an F, D, or three consecutive Cs on the DOE's grading scale are subject to closure. However, the Community Education Council of District 6 says the school's poor performance was due to a lack of funding from the DOE. The owner of a popular dumpling eatery in Brooklyn says he's struggling to turn a profit due to cheap prices that have made him popular. Mr. Chen, owner of Great Taste Dumpling in Sunset Park, told Open City he works 18-hour shifts to continue to offer his five-for-one-dollar dumplings, which have become a staple among hipsters and neighborhood foodies. But at one dollar per five, he barely breaks even. The Fiscal Policy Institute finds that 36 percent of small business owners in New York are immigrants, twice the national percentage. Yet Mr. Chen is an example of how many struggle to find success. The Uptowner reports that scandals from the past are now interfering with the possibility of resurrecting the famed Harlem Boys Choir. 
after Walter Turnbull, the founder of the All Boys Ensemble, passed away in 2009, his brother Horace Turnbull disbanded the choir. Horace recently held six days of auditions in hopes of reviving it, yet only 15 people showed up. Many believe the organization's previous bout with a sex abuse scandal and financial woes have tainted the public's perception of the brand. From France Amérique, one author is on a mission to get children in North America to appreciate gourmet foods. Canadian author Karen Le Billion decided to write her new book titled French Kids Eat Everything after she moved to France with her husband and their two children in 2008. During her time there, she discovered that French children embrace a variety of food, including vegetables and fine cheeses, unlike many children in North America. She lists various rules for parents to adopt, including no more snacks, and adults and children should eat the same things. And finally, a group of Chinese international college students in the United States are playing rock music for a cause. Sing Tao Daily reports that the group called the Little Fur Foundation formed a rock band in 2008 to support underprivileged children in China. So far, the foundation has raised thousands of dollars for high school and college scholarships for poor Chinese students. Its charity concert, called Rock for Hope, has raised $10,000 after holding six shows. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic and community media. Back to Gary and Vianora. Thanks, Abby. The new film, Let the Fury Have the Hour, tracks the stories of artists and thinkers who have become the voice of an emerging counterculture in the U.S. The film features interviews with rapper Chuck D of the politically conscious group Public Enemy and playwright Eve Ensler, writer of the Vagina Monologues. I sat down with the film's director, Antonino D'Ambrosio, to talk more about the project. Antonino, one of the main ideas uh, throughout your film is that of creative response and uh, that of uh, angst and anger becoming the force, uh, the driving force to, to creating uh, art and powerful ideas. Define more what, what creative response is and, uh, and, and, and how much more it is in your view. Well, creative response I think is uh, humanity's great, greatest and grandest talent and that's the the ability to take today's obstacles and problems and turn them into creative opportunities to move society forward. And it can be found in every uh, uh, area of society from, uh, from the actual arts, filmmaking, uh, literature, music, to economic science and, uh, and the environment. Uh, so when Picasso paints Guernica, that's a, a profound and uh, timely and timeless creative response to the brutality of war and it continues to be a testimonial and witness to to those things calling attention to the importance of standing against uh, those things and for humanity what I or, or what I really believe creative response does is uh, mine uh, and, and promote human possibility you chose to to start the story of the film in the 80s explain why well, that's my personal story. You know, starting in the 80s, I was coming of age, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, um, under Reagan. Uh, and my parents were immigrants from a small mountain village called, called Albertuno in Italy. And my father was a bricklayer. My mother was a cafeteria worker. And the, the rhetoric, uh, this harsh brand of individualism that Ronald Reagan was instituting was in direct contrast to how I organized my life, how we survived, which was based on sharing, on looking out for one another. Um, and during this time, uh, you know, this idea of consumerism replaced citizenship, that you defined yourself by what you, what you bought, you know, that you were more loyal to a brand. Corporations were going to be bigger than governments, more powerful than governments. And I, I just didn't buy it. But it created a sense that the world didn't speak to me, didn't speak the language that I had. And at the 11, 12 years old, I discovered all at the same time, essentially punk rock, street art, uh, early rap, and, um, and skateboarding. And these all in different ways allowed me to create a language uh, where I could voice my view of the world and also find a place for myself in the world. Um, and it really challenged um, the, the dominant culture, which said that there wasn't a place for my story and my narrative. 
in your film, there are about 50 voices that are featured, and uh, I'd like us uh, to watch a short clip. I think there's a lot of outliers in the world right now, and that's kind of where my hope is. My hope is with what I don't know about. I think those, there are people making music and, and art work <laughs> um, that's going to actually make us all feel like we want to be better. Talk more about what she's saying and also about uh, the other uh, ideas that are brought forth by, by uh, the rest of the artists uh, featured in the film. Well, the clip we just watched from the poet Suhair Hamad, who's an amazing artist herself, um, it really kind of captures the actual s the, the spirit of the film, which is the idea that uh, our grand talent as, as, as human beings to mind create a response for to reimagine the world, to dream the impossible, to embrace the odd, the, the idiosyncratic, um, the, the, to be anti-ideological and universal. And she's talking about that that's the greatest, uh, the greatest element of being alive. This, this is again the idea of human possibility and doing everything to mine that and reject things that suppress that or restrict that. Uh, I talk a lot about in the film this idea of being for, not against. There's so much of what we're always told is to be against things, to be, you know, and to, to, to that, and this, this thinking divides and pulls us apart. You know, I'm in the film, what all of the, the 50 or so artists and thinkers and advocates and economists are doing is trying to find ways to be for things, you know, and this idea of being for a democratic movement forward which is what, how, how humanity has always moved. It's, why the, the, it's what happened with the invention of the, the printing press or the invention of the city. This is an idea, these are ideas that bring people together, that we think of ourselves as interconnected, interdependent, and as citizens of the world. Give the audience some of the other uh, names of, uh, that they can see in the film. Sure, there's the great playwright Eve Ensler, famous for the vagina mo monologues. Yeah, there's uh, John Sayles, uh, the great filmmaker. There's Eugene Hutz of Gogo Bordello, Chuck D of Public Enemy, uh, Billy Bragg. Uh, there's music from Manu Chow. There's, uh, there's uh, music from Theater Corporation, who are also in the film. There's Van Jones, who's a great um, uh, advocate, and, and advocate and, and activist. There is uh, Jack Healy, who ran Amnesty International USA throughout this, uh, the 1980s. And uh, one of the things he was responsible for was helping to free Nelson Mandela, among many other things. Um, there is uh, Wayne Kramer from the, the, one of the most important rock and roll bands in, I think, of all time, the MC5. Um, you know, so there's a range of, of people. There's Tommy Guerrero, who is one of the most important skateboarders uh, and actually one of the, the pioneers and innovators of what skate skateboarding became. Uh, in the 1980s. So. How do you hope uh, the film to resonate with today's generation, the youth generation who may not be uh, familiar with uh, uh, these, uh, these powerful voices from the 80s? Well, you know, the idea is the film is a metaphor and, you know, if you're thinking at all about the world, and I think young people are, and are thinking about their, how they can inject their own ideas and opinions and feel a sense of freedom and liberation to be part of, of, a, of a greater community than just themselves, um, this will resonate with them because this is really a story about the human spirit and not a particular story about John Sayles or Chuck D. These are just uh, metaphorical uh, you know, frameworks for ourselves to place ourselves within to see that, you know, yes, indeed, my narrative, my t particular worldview, the way I want to reimagine the world is actually valid, and I have the permission and the freedom to, to, to contribute. Antonino D'Ambrosio, thank you so much for being in studio with us today. Thank you so much. The film opens on Friday, December 14th at the Quad Cinema. Stay tuned. When we come back, the end of the world, more whimper than bang? My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Reggie? I think I look more like Denzel. 
That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. And finally from us tonight, the Norse call it Ragnarok. Christians call it the Apocalypse. Whatever the name, it means the end of life and the world as we know it. The latest prediction from the Mayan calendar has doomsday scheduled for December 21st. Although it's a daunting concept to many, one choreographer is trying to explain that the end may be more resurrection than oblivion. Marlene Peralta filed this report. The Mayans knew about it. This is the way the world ends in 2012, according to Hollywood's interpretation of some Mayan prophecies. However, the truth is that civilization may not be drowned by giant waves or swallowed by a gaping hole in the earth. According to the Mayans, this is the fifth time that the world has that change. And what is scary for many people is that there is a ray that it, it comes from the center of the universe that it goes directly to the sun and, and goes directly to the Shivalva. The Shivalva in the Mayan world represents the dead. Javier Sul grew up in a Mayan civilization in the deep jungles of Veracruz, Mexico. He is one of the only Mayan indigenous choreographers in the world who's using dance to illustrate the 2012 Mayan prophecies. I always use in my, in my choreography Mayan elements and this time actually my brother told me you, you know you should do something about the, the end of the Mayan calendar because people are saying that the world's gonna end and we know as Mayans that that's not the way we see it. What the Mayans do see according to Sul is a new beginning at the end of their calendar in 2012. Hence the name of his latest performance. In Mayan culture there is the idea that when you are a king you have the capacity to transform your body. And when you're a priest, you have even more capacity to transform your body into gods, um, animals, into things on the underworld. So you learn since very young how to do that with your body, so you are able to make of your body energy and, and, and magic. That energy and magic is shown through his acrobatic moves and the use of a ribbon rope to transform his body into what he describes as airborne forces of nature and the earth. One such force is the Mayan god represented as a feather serpent. I can find that, that people understand that primitive part of it, but at the same time, because I dance with companies that uh, give me the knowledge of the aesthetic that we see in dance, it helped me to kind of put it in a way that you can see both. You can see the, the, the primal movement, the raw movement, and you can see the beautiful movement with technique and, and acrobacy. He's been part of many recognized dance companies ever since, including Ballet Nacional of Cuba. I have the opportunity to be trained for the best dancers in Cuba. And then I just came out of Cuba for a year and came to same place in Mexico. And then Martha Graham, the company was teaching there and they say, oh, come to New York. We give you a scholarship to take a workshop. Came to New York and stay forever. It has been 20 years since he arrived in New York performing this form of dance he uses to teach the world about his Mayan ancestry and the rituals that have been part of one of the greatest civilizations is still present in America. Marlene Peralta for Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.